Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound. You understand it, 1 John 1, 9. And if you need to follow up with that, and I'm sure you do, then use Romans 6, 6, 6, 11, and 6, 13. That's Operation Cry. If you're out of fellowship with God, you need to use Operation Cry following 1 John 1, 9. So with your head bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. I will close out our prayer time and we'll pick up our study right where we left off in this last session. <clears throat> Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of studying your word. The subject tonight, the first five verses of, really the first four verses of Ephesians 6 deal with how to raise children. And then in five to nine, we're dealing with the concept of slavery. Slavery in antiquity, slavery in recent years around the world, and looking at, the, at an application of this concept to contemporary history in the area of manage, management and employee. I would pray, Father, you would take this session and confirm it to our hearts because we're living in, we're living in desperate times. And we've seen all kinds of racial problems in this country. People slinging racial slurs one way, racial slurs another. Whites against blacks, blacks against whites, Americans against Mexicans, Mexicans against Americans. It's a worldwide system. It's a worldwide thing. Why? Because it's evil. So tonight, let us get a, a historical perspective on this particular subject of not just raising children, but how employees, whether slaves or free men, need to respond to their to their masters to their to management to their employers without regard to without regard to race this is not an easy subject for people to digest given the history of mankind and the racial slurs the racism etc but as born again Christians, we need to we need to know how to handle these circumstances. The word of God's clear. The word of God is clear, Father. Thank you for your provision for us. Thank you for your provision for us this evening. And I'm praying that we'll get through this concept, but if we don't, we'll finish it, I believe, for sure on Wednesday night before we move on into the remaining chapters of chapter uh, the remaining verses of chapter six. So with that in mind, let us turn our attention to the word of God, thanking you for your grace provision, for your mercy toward all of us, your kindness. And I pray, Father, that you would guide us, guide us into the days ahead after January the 20th. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. Uh, we, we need to pick up right there. And what I'd like to do is go back and just rehearse verses five, six, and seven. <clears throat> Remember, verses one through four dealt with how parents should raise children, how children, how children should respond to the authority of their parents. And basically, this whole section here is dealing with authority. The initial authority in our life is Almighty God, God the Father, whose plan we're supposed to be functioning under. But then God has delegated various 
types of authority. He's delegated it. It all belongs to him. But he shares it over here. He said, here, coach, here's some authority. Here, uh, here, CEO, here's some authority. Hey, uh, pastor, here's some authority. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, let's see. Husband, here's some authority. And by the way, parents, here's some authority for you, too. How about this? How about the school teacher? How about the president? Uh, the um, how about the superintendent of the school system? See, authority has been delegated by God, and where you have authority, there's someone in charge. And God's plan is for those who are subservient to be obedient to the authority. So, in for verses one through one through four, hey, children, here's what you do, parents. Here, Father, here's how you treat these children. Now in verse five through five through seven, leading up to verse eight, I'm going to share that background with you. Now let me let me point out something to you. If I turn off my camera and mute my microphone, I'm going to sneeze, okay? I've had a session of sneezing uh, today. And uh, going back to my mother, I think I've inherited her genes in the sense that when she sneezed, she didn't sneeze once. She sneezed eight times. You could count them. One, two, three, four, five. When you got the eight, it was over. And if she ever did it again, there it is. One, two, three, up to eight. Well, I haven't made it to eight. I sometimes get to three. But if I turn off my, if I turn off my microphone and turn off my camera, it's going to, I'm going to sneeze. I'll be right back to you, though, okay? Thank you very much. Beginning in verse five, dealing with slavery. Paul said, you slaves. Now, as far as the scripture is concerned, the immediate slave was back there in Ephesus. We saw that these Ephesian Christians were raised in a reversionistic society and a larger portion of those people before they became Christians were in fact slaves to the Roman Empire. And even after Paul witnessed to them, they became born again Christians, that did not alter their slavery. They were not sent free from slavery just because they got a, became a Christian. And Paul is dealing with these slaves on how you live your Christian way of life because as a slave, you have an employee, you've got a manager, you've got a, a slave master. So he says, you slaves. Now, the, the original meaning was for those slaves in Ephesus back in that period of time. But today, it comes down and makes a relationship to employees who are servants of their managers, of the, of the business with whom they, they are, are connected. So he says, you slaves, slaves and employees, he said, be obeying your, obeying your lords. That were the slave masters and the business managers. How are they to do that? Paul's very clear. He said, you obey your slave masters, your business ma managers, as to your Lord. We know that our immediate, res our re immediate responsibility is to be obedient to God the Father through the person of Jesus Christ. So as we are obedient to him, we are to be obedient to our slave masters and our, our business managers. Then he gives us, a, he gives us a, a way of not to do this. Here's the way you do this. But in verse six, not according to the standard of eye slavery. That means you're, 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 you're trying to impress. You're trying to impress people. Not so much the type of work you're doing, but you're trying to impress the boss. You're trying to impress the manager, the slave owner, in how you're dealing with your job. So not according to eye slavery, as men pleasers, just trying to do your job so that you'll please everybody. He said, but workers, that slaves, employees, belonging to Christ, constantly doing the will of your God from your soul, not from your heart. Remember that word was heart. But in the Greek, it's not cardia, it is suke, which means from the soul. And if you're going to constantly do the will of God from your soul, you have to have something in your soul that's pertinent, and that would be relevant Bible doctrine. Doctrine that is relevant to your circumstance. 
Then in verse 7, not, not only does he tell us what we're to do to obey, he tells us in verse 6 not how to do this. Then in verse 7, he says, okay, now that you're going to obey, obey Christ in verse 5, you're going to be obedient to him. You're going to be obedient. You're going to be obedient to your masters, your employers, just like you're obedient to Christ. But he said, look, here's the way you do this. He said, you do this with loyal enthusiasm, loyalty to Jesus Christ. And you do this with enthusiasm. Performing the duties. What, what, what are the duties of a slave? It's what the master tells you. What is the duty of an employee? It's what the policy of the company is. It's the way your manager wants it done. And how does that how does that work out? As to the Lord. In other words, you deal with the employer, your slave master, in exactly the same way you do with your Lord. And you don't tell your Lord, go fly a kite, get out of here. That's not the way I'm going to do it. No. As to the Lord and not to people. Not to people means not with a standard of eye slavery and not as men pleasers. Now, having found out in verses 5, 6, and 7 what we're supposed to do, he says in verse, seven, in verse 8, he says, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Now, let's take a look at this thing. And interesting enough, I'm going to drop down to the Greek syntax and then come back to that, that verse that I just read. Let's look at the Greek syntax. And this is one of the reasons why, when you're, when you're studying from the Greek language, the syntax, that means the order of the words in a sentence, are not exactly the same as you would have them in English. So by the time you by the time you take a look at a a single word in the Greek, and you translate it, whether it's some form of a verb, whether it's an adverb, whether it's some form of a participle, once you make that translation, now what happens when you run you when when you interpret each one of the words in the syntactical sequence that you find them in? You read those, and oftentimes when you read them, you wonder, what in the world are they trying to tell us? See, it's just a different language. When I was when I was in, at, going to school at UALR, the University of Arkansas in Little Rock, taking 25 hours of sign language, it was amazing. When you're dealing with sign language and you're signing, you, you need, need to realize that a person who has never heard doesn't understand English syntax. And so when you're when you're in trying to interpret, you look out here and you see a, a deaf, a, an interpreter for the deaf. It might be Asa Hutchison or somebody else doing something. And you got this uh, person out there that's doing the signing. You, know, you, you probably don't know what they're saying unless you've taken sign language. But when you when you actually interpret word for word what they're signing, you wonder how in the world do these people understand what they're talking about? Because the order of the words, the words are not the same as in English. We call it American Sign Language. Well, you and I, if I were there, I'd, I'd be trying to sign word for word, word for word in English, but that's not the way it happens in, in the deaf world. So let's look at the Greek syntax. This is not really all that bad, but it's a little different. It says, knowing that each one, if whatever he might have done good, he this he will receive from the Lord, whether slave or free. Now, sometime when I get a real, real bad one, I'll throw that up on the screen too, so you can see what's going on here. Now let's look back up here at this verse as it's translated into the English so you and I can read it and understand it. The word knowing here means to perceive directly with the intellect. That means you know something and you know that you know that you know it. How are you doing that? It is from your intellect. So if you if you don't if you don't have the background, if you don't have the vocabulary, if you don't have the definitions, you don't have that kind of thing, listen, you're not going to understand. But this thing, this word here means you know directly and it's directly from how 
you're understanding up here in your head. Knowing, and what are you knowing? You're knowing that whatever good thing, now remember, we're talking about slaves, we're talking about employees on the job. Not employees at home, we're not talking about, I got a job here, but you're not talking about how you handle your how you handle your wife, how you handle your children. We're talking about how you respond on the job. Knowing that whatever good thing, that's a divinely good thing. Why is, why is what you're doing on the job a divinely good thing? It's because you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. You're being obedient to the word of God while being obedient to the employer. By being obedient to the employer, you being obedient to the word of God because he said, look, you do to your employer, for your employer, exactly as you would do for Jesus Christ. So the good thing, the divinely good thing here is doing your job as unto the Lord, whatever that happens to be. So he says, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, each one, who we're talking about. In Paul's time, we're talking about the slave. It might be a slave anywhere on the planet today or in the past in the United States or anywhere else. If you were a Christian slave, this was God's command to you. So he said, each one does this whatever good thing, then what happens is this. If in fact you do that good thing, you do your job as unto the Lord, he, you, the slave or the free man, you will receive back. You are giving, you are giving good employment, employment. you're giving what, what the employee and the employer wants or the slave master wants but listen that's not the end of it because you have done what you need to do there you have given you are going to receive back but you're not going to receive back from the slave master you're not going to receive back from your employer you may get something but this verse is telling me telling us you will get back something from the lord and it doesn't make any difference whether you are a slave or whether you are free. Now, with that in mind, let's look, let's look here. An interpretive translation, <clears throat> knowing that each one, if he has done anything good, he himself shall receive with interest this same production from the source of the Lord. Now, let me let me just do this for a second. I want to 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 move uh, move away from here for just a moment because we're talking about slavery. So I want to I want to stop right here with this verse, and then we're going to come back and learn some things from this verse. But before we do that, I'm going to move on to a second document that you have in your well, you do not have it in your in in your possession. You will later this evening after I finish here. But I want to go to the biblical concept of slavery that is associated with this passage in, in Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Now, we have just read that verse. So, verse six, 5, 6, and 7. That's the context out of which is the coming. Now, let's do this. Let's get an historical summary. And what I'm talking about is the biblical concept of slavery in association with Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Now, the Bible has much more to say about slavery. But I want to talk about it as it relates to this passage right here. Verses 6, verses 5 through 9. Here's an historical summary. Throughout human history, evils, an evil, an evil can be what you think, a distortion of truth, or it is a practice of that distorted thing that, you're, thing that you're thinking. So human history, throughout human history, evils have always existed, not, not a little bit, not a whole lot, but they have always existed and nothing has ever changed it. Now what that means is that when you take a look at all the evil that's going on, how about the evil that's going on in our present day? Evil is abounding. Evil thinking and evil practice that comes from the evil thinking. But evil has always existed. 
And every time someone has tried to do something to change it, it hasn't changed evil because it just keeps on going. It may pick up and go off in a different direction. But until Jesus comes back, we will not be able to get rid of evil. Now watch this. We have just as much evil today as people had in the past. And as time moves forward from today, there will be no imp So if you think it's bad today, hey, it may get worse tomorrow. But one thing we do know, evil will never go away. And evil is both a is both a thought process and an application of that thought press process to human history. Ask yourself this question. Will you do that? Ask yourself this question. Why is that so? Why is what so? That throughout human history, evil has always existed and nothing's ever changed it. There's been no improvement of evil throughout human history. So we're going to ask ourselves this question, why is that so? Well, the answer is simple. Because that since the fall of man, remember this, the devil has been, he is, and he will be the ruler of this world until the second coming of Christ. Satan is the ruler. He uses people who are filled with false doctrine, disseminating that false doctrine. And I've indicated to you and put out on, on my Facebook page a couple days ago, this long article about how human history is changing, for example, in the United States of America, and how twisted the thinking of the larger number of millennials happens to be in the United States today. Why is that so? Because Satan is not dealing directly with you. He's not dealing directly with me. He's not dealing directly with someone over here. He's using people since the fall of Adam who fell and came into a fallen world with absolutely no information as to how to handle the circumstances of a fallen world. So what do they do? They bear children. The children are growing up. They have no answers, so they just do the very best they can. So along comes someone and says, well, listen, I found this is the best way to handle that. Hey, over here. No, it's better over here. How about this over here? Here's the way you do it. And they begin to, they begin to, to spread that false information from child to child to child to child. And we come down to today and look back one, two generations and see how, how mom and dad handle their children today, how grandma handled them, how great grandma handled them. And what we begin to see is a deterioration of the thinking of people in our country and around the world because they have so little doctrine. However, the lives of people are changed when they respond to the gospel. You got that? So if you want to get things straightened out in life, what we're going to have to do is, first of all, get the unbeliever the gospel, because that's where it all starts. But you and I have seen, for a fact, this is why when you go back to this, this idea of the millennials and what's happening in many of the evangelical churches today, we find they've got the gospel, okay? So you're preaching a good gospel, a right gospel. And many Christians today, many denominations, many sects, S-E-C-T-S, are even preaching a false gospel. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It deals with the death, the burial, the resurrection. Stop right there. No more the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we understand who that was and what he did, and you believe that, you are saved eternally. However, the lives of people are changed when they respond to the gospel. Don't stop there. And then respond to the mystery doctrine, the age of grace, after they become believers. 
We're talking about the age of grace right now. So if we're going to grow in Christ, we don't need what's in the Old Testament. We don't need the law. We don't need what happened with the Gentiles um, it, after, after Adam uh, came out of the garden. We don't need that information. Oh, it's helpful, but they, there are no rules for living back there. That's why we have to respond to the mystery doctrine that Jesus began to give Paul in the wilderness when he was out there in the Arabian desert for three years. And he has set forth the mystery doctrine in all of the 13 letters that he has written. Let's move on from here. Understand this. No one's life, not yours, not mine, not somebody else's. No one's life has ever changed or improved or bettered by following a principle or the principles of evil. That's distortions of truth. How do you know what, whether something is a distortion of truth or not? You can't until you have the counterpart coming from the word of God. That's, again, why it's so important that we study the word of God constantly, constantly. And I no, let, me, let me put it back. Let's use this word consistently, consistently doing this. So, for example, with we, with me, we study. We're studying on Sunday morning, Monday night, and Wednesday. If you don't get the notes when they're sent out, obviously you can't get them while I don't send them, and I didn't send them today. Mm. Forgive me. I'll confess that before the night's over. Well, okay, you get that, okay? Understand this. No one's life has ever changed or improved or bettered by the principles of evil. It has been estimated, listen to this now, it has been estimated that there were between 20 to 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire at the time that Paul wrote the book of Philemon. Now, we're talking here about the book of, uh, we're talking about the, the, the book of Ephesians. And Paul wrote this at a different time. But when he wrote the book of Philemon, he wrote that in 57 to 59 AD from prison in Caesarea Maritima. Okay, we talked about that yesterday morning about the book of Philemon. Let's look at this. You see, the book of Philemon was written to a person named Philemon who was a spiritually mature believer. Let's stop and think what we're talking. Paul's writing the book of Philemon to this man over here who is, in fact, a spiritually mature believer. Philemon is a friend of Paul's. He's not where Paul is. Philemon's in another area. But Paul is in jail, and he is writing this letter to this slave owner. So the book of Philemon was written to the person named Philemon who was a spiritually mature believer, and at the same time, Philemon was a slave owner. Now, if you talk, if you talk to people today, and this is where the distortion of doctrine comes, because people are biblically ignorant. I want to talk to people when I, I, I will talk to people about slavery. I will talk to them about it. But if we're going to talk about it, we must talk about it from a biblical perspective, not some distorted viewpoint out here, which is exactly what this book of Ephesians is, is about distortions of truth. So what we have to have as a we have to have a picture, a true picture of history regarding this subject. And here was here was Philemon, who in fact was a slave owner. And someone might say to me today, no, that's not so. He is not a born again Christian because you cannot be a Christian and be a slave owner. Wrong. Not according to the Bible. And just remember this, being a slave owner is not wrong. It is how you treat your slaves that's wrong. And believe it or not, that's coming up in verse 9. Isn't it amazing? So in verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, we're talking about slavery, what slaves are supposed to do toward their master, or what an employer employee is supposed to do toward the employer. But when we get to verse 9, Paul's going to tell the employer and the slave master what their responsibility is. Isn't that amazing? 
So the book of Philemon was written to a person named Philemon, who was a spiritually mature believer, and at the same time, he was a slave owner. Now, the question is frequently asked, how can a person be a Christian at the same time be a slave owner? The answer is found in the book of Philemon. Historically, in the, in the last period of the Roman Republic, Roman Republic in, in the last period, historically now, in the last period of the Roman Republic, slavery was unparalleled. It was at its highest point. And the abuse of slaves was great. We're not recommending that. We don't want that. That's wrong. That's sinful. But historically, this is true. In the last period of the Roman Republic, slavery was unparalleled and the abuse of slaves was great. The degradation of the slaves, the torture of the slaves, the abuse of the slaves, it was a great evil, a great evil, very sinful and very wrong. Understand, I believe that and it's true. Several sources of slavery have existed several sources of slavery. Well, where do they come from? In addition to kidnapping, unwed mothers selling their children, the Romans suddenly found themselves saddled with prisoners of war. Go out, have a war, they conquer out there, and what do they do? They bring these prisoners back with them. Remember what, we, what Paul told us? In Colossians, he said there in the way Paul's talking about that he's Paul was using in his an historical illustration about the Roman soldiers leading their prisoners to the maritime dungeon, at which point when they arrived there, they would the whistle would blow and bingo, they would slay their they would slay their prisoner. So what was happening here? In addition to kidnapping and unwed mothers selling their children, the Romans suddenly found themselves saddled with prisoners of war. What did they do? So they sold these people into slavery since there was no one to till the soil. And the Romans would have starved to death without farm workers. So Rome goes out to war, they conquer, they bring these slaves back and say, good gracious, look at all these people we got. What are we going to do with them? Well, the people over here said, wait a minute, my farm is going to, going to, it, it's going down the tube. I need some help. So you sell these prisoners into slavery to work on the farms. Historically, this is what happened. So many of these slaves who worked on the farms, listen to this now. Many of the slaves who worked on the farms had a well-to-do life compared to the slaves who worked in the mines. There were some slaves, now listen please, there were some slaves who had a great career because they had a knowledge of medicine and they became doctors in Rome. They made large sums of money for their masters, not for themselves, but for their masters. And often they purchased their own freedom by practicing medicine. They had great lawyers. Lawyers, these were slaves who became lawyers. Now, obviously, you do that. These slavery, these slaves had to have some source of freedom, didn't they? Others were brilliant people and became educators. The whole system of Roman education changed after the Second Punic War in 218 to 201 BC. That's be before Christ now, 218 to 201. After the Second Punic War, there were three. And after the Second Punic War, after slaves became teachers. So the whole system of Roman education changed after that time. And the Romans didn't have much interest in professional activities. They had little, the Romans themselves had little interest in professional activity. So what happened? The slaves took up the slack. All professional activities, such as accountants and business accounts, were kept by slaves. And the Romans were the greatest businessmen in that period of history. These slaves had a pleasant and excellent life. And you say, well, that's not the way, uh, excuse me, I'm talking about history. I'm talking about the way slave owners treated slaves at this point in time. 
We saw that there was great abuse at one point in time, but it wasn't always that way. And when it wasn't always that way, we still had slaves. Now, in the days of Claudius Caesar, 41, 41 to 54, see, we went from 218 up here, from 218 to 201 BC, down to 41 to, 50, 41 to 54 AD, we're, we're now after Christ. Christ has already been born. He already died, buried, resurrected, ascended into heaven. And in the in the days of Claudius Caesar, and this would have been this would have been during that transition period of the age of grace. And during that period, many of the slaves were liberated. Listen to this now. Many of the slaves were liberated to become the rulers of the Roman Empire. And the entire administration of Rome was handled by former slaves. Slavery was always a big issue as far as the Romans were concerned. And the decline of the Roman people, the decline of the Roman people can be attributed to the problems that were associated with slavery. Now consider this. Slavery that destroys human freedom is a principle that cannot be tolerated, but suppose but suppose a circumstance arises in which slavery is actually destroying freedom. Let me let's read that again. Consider this. Slavery that destroys human freedom is a principle that cannot be tolerated. That means we can't accept that. Slavery that's destroying human freedom. But suppose a circumstance arises in which slavery is actually destroying freedom. The question is this, what should be done about it? Hold it now. You may not get the answer you're looking for. But let's follow that first question. What should be done about it with even a more serious question? And here it is. Should believers become involved in fighting slavery? Let me think about that. Even another question. Historically, do we find the rise of organizations among Christians in early body of Christ rising to fight, fight, uh, fight slavery? Let's go back and look at these questions again. Slavery, that just, first of all, the statement, slavery that destroys, that destroys human freedom is a principle that cannot be tolerated. That's clear. But suppose a circumstance arises in which slavery is actually destroying freedom. What should be done about that? Done about what? Slavery, that is, where you have slave owners that are destroying freedom, slaves or others. What should be done about it? Well, I know what I do about it, do you? Hold on now. The next question is, should believers be, become involved in fighting slavery? Should we get an organization out or should we go, should we go to war against these, these people who, are, uh, who have and own slaves? Excuse me. Historically, we do not find the rise of organizations among Christians. We do not, do not, D-O-N-O-T. We do not find the rise of organizations among Christians in the early body of Christ rising to fight, sl fight slavery? So the answer is no, because rising to fight against slavery is not the issue. That is not the issue. You don't do away with slavery by fighting slavery. Remember, slavery is e slavery, slavery where there is, uh, there is abuse of slaves that cannot be tolerated, that is evil, it is sin, and it's not right. But we cannot stop evil. See, that's the issue. You cannot stop evil. You cannot destroy evil. We cannot even make a dent in evil. What is the real objective then? The objective of the believer is quite different. The objective is to take in doctrine and grow in grace. You see, in Paul's generation, evil is stopped. Evil was stopped not by fighting evil, but by tactically achieving victory in the Christian way of life. And the thing that changes society in any generation is the number of mature believers in that society. Remember, 
that Jesus Christ controls history, not you, not me, not us, Christ controls history, and that he honors the principle that where there is anyone in the society who is a mature believer, slave or free man, there will be a periphery of blessing around them. So, we shouldn't fight slavery as Christians. We shouldn't directly fight the evils of our day as Christians. We fight the evils of our day not by joining organizations, not by joining parties, clubs, or groups who are going to change the country, but we fight the evils of our day by the intake of Bible doctrine. It is an individual situation. Slavery had changed at the time of the rise of the body of Christ in the first century. Listen to this. Slavery had changed at the time of the rise of the body of Christ in the first century. And many of the local and many of the local assemblies were filled with born-again slaves. See, that's where the change came. There was a period of time where there was abuse of slaves. But there came a period of time when the when the abuse of slaves was not there. That you, we saw we saw what happened historically where the slaves just came in and sort of took over. <coughs> and remember, they can't do that. They can't do that unless they have some semblance of freedom. Now, that doesn't mean they've been released from slavery. That means within the context of slavery, they had some freedom. As long as they were doing their job as unto the Lord, doing their job exactly like this, like the slave master said, there was freedom to do things after that period of time. So slavery had changed at the time of the rise of the body of Christ in the first century. That's when it came on the scene with the apostle Paul. And many of the local assemblies were filled with born-again born slaves. That's why when Paul writes, when Paul writes to Corinth, when Paul writes to Ephesians, when he writes, when he writes to the Colossians, when he writes to the Corinthians, he's talking to congregations that have slaves in them. Well, how could you be a slave and be a church? Be in the, be in the local assembly. It's because slavery did not confine the slave 24 hours a day as long as the slave was doing their job that was it that's why there were slaves to do that job you see roman slavery had changed in so many locations that's they see that's in rome in, in the roman empire roman slavery slavery among the roman empire had changed in so many locations that slaves used their free will, oh, slaves used their free will to exercise their right to come and go as pleased. Well, I, how does a slave do that? This is the way slavery was to be carried out. When you leave your job, you do, uh, while you're on your job, eight hours a day, however you work and whatever, the, whatever your schedule is, while you are on the job, you are working, doing exactly what your employer wants you to do, and you're doing that as you would do that if Lord was your, was your manager. And he is your super manager. He is your super manager. So by doing your work, doing, doing the will of the, the manager on the job or the slave master, you are actually honoring Jesus Christ. So Roman slavery had changed in so many locations that slaves used their free will to exercise their right to come and go as pleased, and slaves were free to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Philemon, in fact, was a wealthy believer in Colossae, that's the Colossian church, in Colossae who had many slaves. Philemon was wealthy as a believer and he had many slaves. And one of Philemon's slaves, was a man by the name of Onesimus. We read about that yesterday. One of Philemon's slaves by the name of Onesimus had stolen money. He stolen, had stolen from Philemon and had run away to Rome. In Colossae, there's Philemon. He's got, he's got slaves. One of, them, one of them is Onesimus. He's a wealthy man. And Onesimus says, whoop, I, oh, look at that over there. Whoop, he grabs a pile of money, we don't know how much, but off he goes, and he goes off to Rome. And what happened? 
in Rome, Onesimus lived it up with the money he had stolen from Philemon. And what was the result? Then he began to starve. And during that period of time, he began to rem remember something that Philemon had said for many times. He had heard Philemon talking about who? The Apostle Paul. So Onesimus finally found Paul in Rome. And what did he do? He went to see Paul. Oh, Paul, I was a slave back there with, with Philemon. He was a nice guy. I was working for him. Boy, he had piles of money. And Paul, I stole from him. I stole some money and I ran away. Guess what, Paul? I blew it. Look, here I, here I am today, Paul. I don't have anything. So I've heard him talking about you, Paul. You, Paul, what a nice guy you are. I find you in, I find you in prison. He finally found Paul in Rome, so he went there. And Paul did the only thing that should ever be done. Are you listening? Paul did the only thing that should ever be done. What did he do? He didn't say, ho, oh, I'll tell you what. You mean Philemon is still a slave owner? Let's go back there and disrupt that thing, get rid of that slavery idea with Philemon. No, you know what he did? Paul took that unbelieving Onesimus and he gave him the gospel. Why? Because it is the gospel that changes things. It's the gospel that changes things. It is the gospel that turns the world upside down. Not the social gospel. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, the gospel that Jesus rose again, the gospel that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, the gospel that whosoever believeth, whosoever, whosoever believeth in Christ shall not perish, will not perish, but have what? Life for a week. No, not life for a week, everlasting life. That means life that has no ending. You see, this is the gospel that changes. And you know what? You, you want to know what Onesimus did? Onesimus responded. He responded to the gospel. He believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Guess what? After Onesimus was saved, Paul taught him. Paul taught him on a consistent basis, and guess what happened? Onesimus kept taking in the Word of God, taking in the Word of God, taking in the Word of God, and apparently during this time, Onesimus became the servant of Paul. Well, hello. How about that? He became the servant of Paul. Paul's in jail. Onesimus was serving was serving Philemon. He stole from him, went to went to Rome, lost all of his money, starving, goes and sees Paul, becomes a born-again Christian, goes back to Paul. Paul keeps teaching him. And Onesimus is going to is going to grow up to be a mature believer. So Onesimus kept taking in the word of God, and apparently during this time, Onesimus became the servant of Paul. Now, notice this again. He became a born-again Christian, but he didn't stop there. He kept on growing through the intake and application of the word of God, being taught by the apostle Paul while Paul is in jail. Onesimus was taught by Paul. He heard the, he heard the Bible taught every day. Who was teaching him? Paul was teaching. Where was Paul? What? Where was the assembly hall? Well, uh, uh, come on down here to jail. I'll give you some more doctrine. So what did Onesimus do? He heard and grew until this runaway slave, Onesimus, became a mature believer. Now watch this. Onesimus ran away as a slave. He meets Paul. He becomes a born-again Christian. He's still a slave. He grows under Paul's ministry. He grows to maturity. He's still a slave. So, however, Onesimus, as a slave, was still a runaway slave. He was a runaway, born again, spiritually adult believer 
and still a slave. He had not been freed. And at the time when Paul decided it was time to send Onesimus back to Philemon, he's going to send him back there. So he's still a runaway. He hasn't been freed because he's saved. And the time came then when Paul said, you know what, Onesimus, it's time for you to go back to Philemon. What? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm a mature believer. I'm saved now. I'm free, am I not, Paul? No, you still belong to Philemon, Onesimus. So when Paul was writing the fourth chapter of Colossians, see, we're, we're in Ephesians. Then we, now we're in, we were in Ephesians to start with tonight. Then we went to Colossians here. I, it, I'm sorry. We went to Philemon, chapter one. And now we're going to go back to the book of Colossians in chapter four. So when Paul was writing the fourth chapter of Colossians, he mentions in verse seven and eight, a man by the name of Tychicus, the great believer who was coming to Colossae to teach the word of God. So Paul was writing to uh, to um, the Colossians, and he mentions this man, Tychicus, who Paul said and teaches us that is a great believer, and that man was actually going to Colossae to teach the word of God. That was in verses 7 and 8. But in that same chapter in verse 9, Paul says, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is from among you, isn't that amazing? See, Onesimus was with Tychicus at that time. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved believer, believer who is among you, that's at Colossae, he says, so now we are going to have a Christ. Now, he, Paul doesn't say that. I'm saying this. Get the idea. In, Col in Colossians chapter 4, verse 9, Paul talks about Onesimus and said, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is among you there at Colossae. Now, what we're, what we're, what's going to happen now is this. Because, because Onesimus is a runaway slave, now saved, a mature believer, still not free, we're going to have a, we're going to have a crisis of grace. Where is the crisis of grace coming? The crisis of grace is coming with Philemon back there. The man from whom Onesimus ran away, having stolen the money. So the question is this. We're now going to have a crisis of grace. And the question is this. How is Philemon going to take this situation? What's the situation? Here's his runaway slave, Onesimus, returning voluntarily, but he is not returning as a fugitive slave. He's returning as a mature believer type slave. Therefore, there is a crisis of grace that Philemon must face. So on the occasion then of the return of Onesimus, this brings to focus the greatest social problem of that day. How will Philemon deal with his runaway slave who had stolen from him? That was the question. Now, you see, here's the issue. Paul constantly ran into the problem of slavery, no matter, no matter where he went, because slavery was rampant in the Roman Empire. So when he's witnessing, he's witnessing to slaves. He's witnessing to free men. Slaves get saved. Free men get slaved. These people get slaved. They, they congregate in a, in, a, in a group somewhere in a local assembly. And they're taught by Paul. They're taught by pastor teachers. Slaves and free men worshiping together. So Paul constantly ran into the problem of slavery. He referred to it in 1 Corinthians 7, 20 and 22. Now, look, I didn't, I didn't copy that verse. You can read it yourself. Half of the Corinthians, are you ready? Half of the Corinthians were slaves. How about that? The local slimity was made up of slaves and free men. In verse 20, as a matter of fact, I've got these passages for you here. In verse 20, it says each, well, hold it now. Are you ready? Each 
person is to remain in that state in which he was called. Now, being called means being saved. So when he, Paul's telling these people, when you get saved, when you, when you become a born-again Christian, you are to remain, you are to stay in that same state in which he was, in which you were called. He did, he's not saying, if you were saved in Arkansas, you stay there. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, you're, you were saved in Florida? No, stay there. Wait a minute. No, I think I was saved in California. I want out of there. No, you, you, we're not talking about that state. He's talking about the state, that circumstance in which you were saved. Each person, and what we're talking about here is whether you are say whether you are a slave or whether you are a free person. Each person is to remain in that state in which he was called. Then Paul explains in verse twenty one. He said, "Were you called as a slave? Did you get saved as a slave? Were you a slave when you got saved?" What does Paul say? Do not let it concern you. Now listen. This is why I'm indicating to you that when you when you when you hear people talking about slavery today, whether whether they're talking about it in a good way, a bad way, an enlightened way, or an unenlightened way, we need to ask ourselves: What does the Word of God say? We're not interested in deception. We're not interested in lies. We're not interested in deception. We're interested in the truth. And Paul says, remember angelic conflict? Paul says each person is to remain in that state in which he was called. Were you called as a slave? Do not let it concern you. But if you are able to become free, listen now, he said, but if you are able to become free, take advantage of that. Now, what we're saying here is if you get the chance to be manumitted, freed from slavery in a legitimate kind of a way, by all means accept it, but do not try to break out. Verse 22, for the one who is called in the Lord, saved in the Lord, if you're saved, you're in the Lord, but if you, for the one who was called in the Lord as a slave, is the Lord's slave, I'm sorry, is the Lord's freed person. For the one who is called in the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freed person. You have freedom in the Lord. You have freedom to serve him, but you're going to serve him according to your slave master or your employer. Likewise, the one who is called as free is Christ's slave. So the, so the slave becomes saved and becomes the Lord's freed person. But the person, but the person who is free and is saved becomes Christ's slave. Hmm. You see, slavery was used many times in the Bible in, to illustrate Bible doctrine. Slavery was used many times to illustrate Bible doctrine, as in Galatians 4, 1 through 7. But listen, slavery was neither commend, condemned nor commended by early Christianity. In early Christianity, this is when the Word of God was formed. This is when the this is when the 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 mystery doctrine of the age of grace was being taught, being taught by the Apostle Paul as given to him by Jesus Christ. And nowhere in the in that early stages of Christianity was slavery either condemned or commended. In other words, slavery was neither commended nor condemned by the word of God. You see, social problems and social action are never the primary issue for the believer. To first become involved in social action is to become entangled with the things of the world. The solution to all social problems and all social evil lies in the realm of Bible doctrine. Therefore, the believer is to avoid any distraction that will take him or her away from learning Bible doctrine, and this includes getting involved in organizations that are going to straighten up the country and clean up the world. No, that's not God's plan. Evil was here before we arrived, and evil will be here after we leave. 
This is one of the greatest lessons of history. You see, the Bible approaches slavery from the viewpoint of salvation. You hear that? The Bible approaches view, uh, slavery from the viewpoint of salvation and growth in grace. From the point of spirituality and doctrine resin in the soul. I got to stop right here for just a minute. If you haven't already, if you are on Facebook, I want you to go to my Facebook page and I want you to scroll down far enough. Won't be, won't be too far down. But I want you to scroll down far enough until you see that black man who is singing on the Bill Gaither program. He was talking. Oh, my goodness. Here's what I want you to do. If you haven't seen it yet, you go see it. And then you contact me. You go, you go see it. You listen to it. Think, think it through. That is an amazing, it's about a seven minute video. This black pastor just so happens he's from the Seventh day Adventist. But what he said and what he did on that program that night is absolutely amazing, and it has everything to do with what we're talking about here. Then he sang for them. Amazing. You see, the Bible approaches slavery from the viewpoint of salvation and growth in grace, from the standpoint of spirituality and doctrine resident in the soul. The Bible was not opposed to manumission. Listen to me. The Bible was not opposed to manumission. That means the freedom of slavery. The Bible was not opposed to that. And the Bible was not fighting against slavery. The Bible did not stand against the great social evil, of, uh, socially, social evil of slavery. However, the Bible takes a stand, evangelize and grow in grace. Let's go back to our passage. Interpretation. Interpretive translation of verse 8. Knowing that each one, slave and free man, if he does anything good, divinely good, doing your work on the job, doing what you're supposed to, he himself shall receive with interest this same production from the source of the Lord, whether he is a slave or a free man. You will be rewarded as a result of doing your job as in the Lord. Now, here's some things that we need to consider and learn from this verse. Verse 8. The working believer, what's he do? The working believer does his or her work today, just as today. That you have a job, we're talking to you. Let's look down the list. Anybody out there got a job? If you have a job, guess what? The working believer does his or her work today, just as the slave, his or her work in the time of the Roman Empire. And how did they do it? They did their work as unto the Lord, slave or employee, other than a slave. And today we do the same thing. The employee is going to do his work as unto the Lord. So it's exactly the same. Point number two. The word for good here is good of intrinsic value or divine good, if you're going to do good. See, knowing that, it, that each one, if he has done anything good, so the word good here is good of an intrinsic value or divine good. And remember that the context here is slaves working for masters in the Roman province of Asia in the time of Paul. A contemporary interpretation, moving and advancing all the way down to today, is not slaves who are working for someone else. It's employees working for employers. So no matter what, the rank in life, whether you're slave or free. The work ethic of both slave or free person should be accomplished how? As unto the Lord. And here's the principle. A person in a, state, in a state of slavery can live in such a manner as to honor God. Do you hear that? 
a person in a state of slavery can live in such a manner as to honor God. Now, the same thing is true of an employee. A person in a state of freedom can live in such a manner as to honor God. Point number seven. A slave master may not fairly compensate a slave. That we, we saw that there were, there were periods of time in Rome, in the Roman Empire, when the slave masters were abusive. They were unfair. So a slave master may not fairly compensate a slave. But if the Christian servant is faithful, but if the Christian servant is faithful to God, the servant will be properly con compensated at the bema seat. Now listen, listen to that now. A slave master may not fairly compensate a slave, but if a but if the Christian servant, the Christian servant is a slave who happens to be a, to be a slave uh, to be a slave. It's a, a the, the, Let's look at it again. A slave master may not be may not fairly compensate a slave. So you've got the slave master over here. You've got the slave. The slave is doing a great job, but the slave master is totally, totally unfair. But if the Christian servant, that means the slave, who is a Christian, if that slave is a is faithful to God, that slave, that servant will be properly compensated at the bema seat. Our passage told us that. It is in this way that experientially spiritual slave or free men will make the evils of servitude tolerable. How is it you are going to tolerate as a slave, as a free person who is employed, how is it that you're going to make your servitude, that means your work on the job, how are you going to make that tolerable? And here it is. It is to be an experientially spiritual slave or free man. That means you have grown in your Christian way of life. You become a born again Christian. You have grown in your Christian way of life and you are applying the word of God to your life, life without regard to the policy, the temperament, the personality of the person or people you work with. See, even you, I, we, Today, to experientially spiritual life as a free man or a slave, we can make the evils of servitude, those things that are going haywire on the job, we are able to do that and understand it in a tolerable kind of a way. Make the evils of servitude tolerable. That's Paul going through all the persecution. He's a great example for us. Point number nine. Servants, slave or free, who are oppressed in servitude, that means on your job, doing your work, should be taught to view their trials with a patient attitude and look forward to their reward at the Bema seat. The scripture told us. If we will do our work as unto the Lord, even though it's intolerable, it's a menial task. You don't like it. You don't want it, but you just go ahead and do it anyway. Because of your patient attitude during these trials in your life, you can look forward to the reward when you get to the Bema Seat. And the reward of the Bema Seat will be distributed to the slave or the free person based upon having done their job as unto the Lord. Verse 8. Knowing that each one, slave or free, if he has done anything good, that's intrinsically good. That means anything that you've done on the job that's, that's the right thing. You're following the policy. You're bearing up under intolerable circumstances. <clears throat> he himself shall receive with interest this same production. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he himself shall receive with interest this same production from the source of the Lord, whether he's sl a slave or a free man. Hold on just a moment.
Sorry, thank you. Here's the issue. We finished verse eight, we got one more to go. We can't finish that tonight. So we'll start, we'll start on Wednesday night with verse nine. And what we're going to do now, when we get to verse nine is after having seen in verse five, six, seven, and eight, how God deals with slaves, employees. He's gonna to come to verse nine, he's gonna say, okay, now, slave masters, employers, you've heard what God's will is for these people who are working for you. So I want you to listen up, slave master. I want you to listen up, employer. He said, I have a word for you. And Paul in verse nine is gonna tell us God's plan for the slave master or the person who's the manager on the job. Thank you for being with me tonight. God bless all of you. We'll be back again, uh, back again on Wednesday night. Now remember on Wednesday night, listen to me please. On Wednesday night, that's, that's January the 6th. And that's the night and the day that Congress will be voting on who will become the next president of the United States based upon dealing with the electoral college votes. Please do not allow that to disturb you. If things don't go the way you would like for it, you better show up at Bible class because we may have an answer for you as to how to handle that set of circumstances, which aren't going to be very good. Been warning about this for a long, long, long time. But I want you to understand what to do and how to do it. Because our masters in the near future may be other than what you want and what you like. Possibly. So come back to Bible class this next, uh, this coming Wednesday, and let's continue our study of the Word of God. See, that's what happens after you're saved. The next thing to do is to keep on consistently taking in the Word of God. And I pray that on your behalf, in Christ's name, amen. God bless you, and I love every one of you. You, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. All of you. God bless you. See you Wednesday night. Good night.